When we talk about phasing out of fossil fuels, people like us mean the statement because fossil fuels are denying us our future, our present, livelihoods, are at stake. and welcome to Facing Future TV. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, professor, author, and activist, and the founder and executive director of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center. Today, we have an incredibly important inter intervention, fossil fuel endgame. We know that we have less than eight years left to act on climate to avert the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Yet even now, as we sit at COP28 in the UAE, we understand that we are not, or that we, we think we will not get the results that we need in temp, uh, reversing the impacts of fossil fuels and stop using as many fossil fuels. The truth is, is that we cannot address the climate crisis unless we can address the use of fossil fuels. And so today, we're going to talk to some activists from two continents who are facing the direct impacts of fossil fuel extraction, and we'll also speak to a visionary leader who is looking to transition the world away from fossil fuels. So first, let me introduce Patience Nabaka. Nabu Nabukalu. She's a passionate Ugandan climate activist deeply committed to the cause of climate and environmental conservation. She's with Fridays for the Future Uganda, where she's an organizer, and her initiatives aim to raise awareness about the climate crisis. She is actively involved in the Stop the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, and that's something we're going to hear more about. Then we'll hear from John Beard. He's an environmental justice activist based in Texas who's become a breakthrough frontline leader fighting fossil fuel development. Um, he founded the Port Arthur Community Action Network to fight for the health and safety protections in an area teeming with refineries, export terminals, petrochemical plants, and cancer. And then later we'll also hear from Hank Rogers who I'll introduce at that point. So, patience. If you could please tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and what is going on with this East African uh, pipeline in Uganda. My name is Patience Nabukalu. I'm a climate justice activist from Uganda. And uh, one of the countries that are uh, least prepared for the climate crisis, but at the front line of the climate crisis. Uganda is one of those countries when you talk about floods, uh, when you talk about landslides, when you talk about droughts, it's at the front line. Death of people, children not going to school. We are at the front line, and it is yet to suffer more from the East African Could Oil Pipeline once it's built. The East African Could Oil Pipeline will be the longest heated oil pipeline around the world if constructed. It will emit 34 million metric tons of carbon emissions per year. And this is almost 10 times both Uganda and Tanzania's annual emissions per year. It is to uh, move from the northern part of Uganda down to Tanzania and, to, and onto the Indian Ocean. It will be a 1,443 kilometer pipeline. It is already a threat to communities like ours. It has displaced, even before its construction, it has displaced over 100,000 people from their homelands. And this means lost cultures, lost traditions, lost lives, people losing who they are because of the continued colonial exploitation from the global north. It's a project owned by one of the biggest so-called companies from the global north. When we talk about phasing out of fossil fuels, people like us mean the statement because fossil fuels are denying us our future, our present, livelihoods, 
are at stake. A third of this pipeline is passing through Lake Victoria basins, and in case of any oil spill, the, the lake is at risk. Lake Victoria feeds over 40 million people, and all of this is at risk because of one single project. We need to phase out of fossil fuels. We need to act now because the future is not in fossil fuels. When the global north countries come, to our country, come down to the global south to exploit, they come with sweet words of development. Oh, Uganda needs oil for development. Oh, Uganda will have jobs for the people once this happens. But this is all false. They're just interested in making more, more, and more profits and extracting more and more fossil fuels on, on the African continent. Uganda does not need ECOP to develop. Uganda can be rich in very many ways through agriculture, afforestation, through fishing, but the global north countries choose to exploit, to chase away people from their lands, communities, children are no longer going to school. People are pushed from their lands even with no and little compensation. This is unjust to countries like ours, to countries like mine, to people like us who are fighting. We come to cope with a lot of hope in us, but not in leaders. Because leaders are continuing to betray us. When you look at this COP, it is filled with thousands of fossil fuel lobbyists. What does this mean? We are running on false hope, but we shall not stop demanding for the truth. And the truth is phasing out of fossil fuels. And now, we are down there fighting for our lives, our communities, our future. I take this opportunity to tell all our leaders out there that we shall not stop to demand for our rights. Even when we are detained, we shall come back on streets. Even when our fellow activists are arrested, we shall still come back on the streets until we attain the justice we deserve, the justice we want. Right now, seven activists who are fighting for the East African crude, against the East African crude oil pipeline are arrested. They are in prison. Some were refused to come to COP at the airport. This is putting us, our lives, our, our families, our friends at risk because of the future we want. Mm -hmm. And we shall not stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, for your, um, thank you for your work and dedication. And we want to be here to support you exactly as folks get arrested so you can remain um, fighting for yourself and your people and our planet. Now I want to turn to um, an activist and leader from the United States, which of course is the world's top oil producer, uh, Mr. John Beard. If you could tell us a bit about what it's like to be in the belly of the beast in the United States. Thank you, Raya. Somehow I knew she was going to say that because I always <laughs> tell people about that in terms of talking about Port Arthur, what it's like to be in the belly of the beast and what it's like to be at the nexus of climate change. But I want to go back to your original theme about this being the end game. You know, I'm a, I'm a comic book reader from way back. And with the Marvel comic universe being brought to life now and looking at the <laughs> Avengers, they were talking about one of their movies was The End Game, where we are in the end game. And we truly are with regard to climate change. Port Arthur's the perfect example of it. It's the poster child for it, if you will. We are, as someone mentioned earlier, a part of the global north, but we are also distinct because we consider ourselves to be the Gulf South, where a lot of the petrochemical refining oil exports and crude and uh, LNG exports are coming from, with over 13 LNG facilities being proposed to export more oil and gas, or fracked gas as we call it, to the rest of the world. I call it poisonous fracked gas. Mm. But just a little bit on Port Arthur, if you will. 
Port Arthur is a city of about 57,000 people located in the very southeast corner of Texas, where you see, if you look at a map, Louisiana, Texas, and the Gulf of Mexico meet. That's me. That's us <laughs> in Port Arthur. And the oil and gas industry in the United States, to, to be uh, frankly, frank about it, began just 15 miles north of Port Arthur in Beaumont with the Lucas Gusher that came in in 1901. Port Arthur was founded in 1898 and 1901. Here comes the Lucas Gusher, which started this whole mess, so to speak. And out of that, were two, three refineries were created. One in Beaumont, Texas, which is now ExxonMobil, the second largest refinery in the country and my former employer. And two were in Port Arthur, Texaco, which is now Motiva, the largest refinery in the country, and Valero, which is another large refinery, in addition to Total. So you have these major refiners there and many other major petrochemical companies, but you also have other companies that are ancillary to that. But what I'm saying and driving at it is this, that we have been overburdened by industrial pollution for over 12 decades. We have some of the most toxic air in the 95th percentile of all of the country. We have co uh, corporations like Total, a French company, which is putting pollutants in the air like benzene, the third largest emitter in America. And then you have another company, Indorama, just down the way from them. And Indorama is the largest emitter of ethylene oxide. Both of those two substances are cancer-causing. So it should be no coincidence to you that we found out in 2010 that Port Arthur, we found out from the US EPA of all people, that Port Arthur had over twice the state and national average for cancer, as well as heart and lung and kidney disease. And there are numerous other contaminants I can tell you about. I can tell you about one of the LNGs that's putting formaldehyde in the air and a German pellets facility that exports our wooden, our trees, puts them, turns them into pellets, and in that process uses formaldehyde. So when we're smelling in our neighborhood and community the smell of like you're in a wood shop or somewhere where someone's sawing wood, that's not just wood you're smelling. You're actually smelling formaldehyde. So essentially we are dead men walking because formaldehyde is a main ingredient in embalming fluid. So here we are with all of these contaminants, not the least of which to mention with Oxbow that puts nitrous oxides and sulfur compounds in the air. So this very toxic soup has affected the lives and health of people. Now, let's go back to the end game. Why are we in the end game? We're in the end, ga we're in the end game because we like to say we've had enough and we're not going to take it no more. Mm. We are tired of being sacrificed for multi-billion dollar companies to make billions in profit while Port Arthur and other communities along the Gulf South look like third world countries. When you have them coming to you and talking about the jobs and opportunities and good things for life they create, well, here's a slice of what that economic life looks like in Port Arthur. You have that city of 57,000, two thirds of which are economically disadvantaged. That's, if you will, a family of four living on an average of $35,000 a year. But then you also have the ratio of 27% of that number. That's the poverty line. That's that same family of four, but living on less than $21,000 a year. Average home value, less than $60,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So of any of the factors in all of Southeast Texas you look at to see the wealth of a community, you will see that Port Arthur, as well as Freeport, Corpus Christi, Brownsville, Lake Charles, all of these lag far behind, yet you have an industry that's paid some of the highest wages and salaries in the country. Well, how can that be? What's going on here? Well, there's two words to describe that. It's economic racism and it's environmental injustice. There you go. That's what's going on. That's exactly what's going on. Um, thank you so much, John. And I really wanted to uplift leaders who are fighting the fossil fuel industry because of the direct impacts that the, the oil and gas industry on many levels are having on their communities. And then I also want to talk to a visionary leader who's thinking about solutions on a global scale. So next I want to uh, hear introduce Mr. Hank Rogers. He's one of the world's leading advocates and activists for reducing and eventually eliminating humankind's dependence on fossil fuel. He's the founder, visionary, and chairman of the board at, also at the Blue Planet Foundation, which paved the way for the state of Hawaii to reach 100% renewable energy goals. And 
Prior to focusing on environmental protection, he was a pioneer in Japan's computer game industry, developed Black Onyx, the first role-playing game in Japan, and is perhaps best known uh, for managing the worldwide, worldwide rights to Tetris, one of the most popular video games in history. So as we're talking about visions and we're talking about games, I'd love to hand it over to Hank Rogers, please, to tell us about your work at the Blue Planet Alliance. <clears throat> yes, so um, I, I look at the problem as a, uh, on a global scale. So what is really the problem? The problem is that carbon dioxide is being produced by us. Um, the, the problem is that we're consuming fossil fuel. We, and when I say we, I'm talking about all of us because we all flew here. We all drive cars where we come from. We all have electricity that's generated by fossil fuels. And the way that I, th I think that we need to stop all of this is by stopping the consumption of these fossil fuels. Now, how do we do that? And uh, I, I faced this problem in Hawaii um, some, well, 15 years ago now. Um, and I thought about how are we going to end the use of carbon-based fuel in Hawaii? Carbon-based fuel is my term for fuels that produce carbon dioxide. And um, we thought about it. We tried many things. And first of all, we checked. At that time, Hawaii was importing $5 billion a year on oil and a billion dollars of coal. 30% goes to jet fuel of the, of the oil. 30% goes to... Uh, ground transportation, and 40% or $2 billion goes to making electricity. That's $2 billion plus a billion dollars of coal, $3 billion. And, uh, you know, we went and talked to the utilities. We would like you to change to renewable energy. And their answer is, what are you talking about? This is how we make electricity. We've always made electricity this way. Why should we change? Now, you're asking us to do something which is new, unproven technology, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same nonsense story that you hear all around the world from utilities and governments. And uh, so we went to the government and we talked to the government and the governor says, why do you want to change things? What is, you know, this is how we make electricity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we, we kind of figured out that, that that method wasn't working. By talking to the company at the top of consumption or talking to the government, which is, uh, makes the rules, that's just not the, the, the way to start. So we, we changed our tactic. We decided to go and, and uh, ask the people for help. Now, how do we get to the people? Because people, in general, when I say people, I'm talking about adults. Adults are, again, I drive my car to work. Why are you asking me to buy it? Why do you ask me to change? Um, I'm barely making it the way it is. And so we thought, OK, let's, let's start with the children, the children. And what we, the first thing that we did in Hawaii is actually is we had elementary school children go door to door and exchange 300,000 light bulbs. This conversation between a child and adult meant that the child is explaining, this light bulb is going to save you money. And this light bulb is the way that you're going to save my future. And the children then ask their parents, and then the parents push the politicians. And finally, we passed a law in Hawaii that says, Hawaii has to be 100% renewable by 2045. We followed it up by changing the business model of the utility so they make more money by switching to renewables. Guess who's our best friend now? They went from it's impossible to, of course we can do this. And that's the, that's the, the mind change that we need to see in the world. Everybody has to understand that the alternative to fossil fuel is renewable energy. And renewable energy, in general, is cheaper. And of course, it's not damaging to the environment. So why don't we switch? And the, and the answer is, we have the money. We have the technology. We're just missing the, the willpower. And so that's why I'm here. I'm here to help people get the willpower to achieve 100% renewable energy, for one, by 2045. Thank you. Um, why don't I go ahead and ask a few questions, and I'll start with you, Hank. What are your impressions of here at the COP, COP28, as, as patients mentioned, and it's no secret, is that is being hosted, the presidency is the state-owned um, oil company of the UAE. Um, what are your thoughts on COP, and what are you hopeful about? What do you think we're going to accomplish? Um, it's, it's, it's strange, but, uh, you know, people have, if, ask me if I have hope, and I say, no, I don't have hope. I have determination. 
because determination is going to get us there. Hope is kind of like you're waiting for somebody else to do something and, and help you do something. But this is not something that somebody else is going to do. We, the United People, not they, the United Nations, are going to solve this. We are going to demand from our politicians that we end the, the use of carbon-based fuel. And, you know, I, I talk about uh, uh, 2045. Nothing happens if you don't have a deadline. So, for example, I want a building built. Okay, talk to the engineers and the architects, um, and they're, I'd like to build this t tall building. How long is it going to take? Well, we hope it's going to be done someday. <laughs> that is not how the world works. You set a date, you agree to a date with everybody involved, and then you say, by that time, that building is going to be built. By that time, we're going to end the use of carbon-based fuel. And then you draw a line from here to there, and you figure out all the steps that you need to take to achieve that goal. That's just simple engineering. We all know how to do this. I mean, every country knows how to do this. We have pro public projects all the time. This is just another, it's a gigantic public project. We need to transform the entire infrastructure of the world from fossil fuel to renewable energy. And when we do that, the demand for fossil fuel will go away. The demand for pipelines will go away. The demand for, for refineries will go away. So stop it at the consumption and everything will be solved. And we are the ones, we are the consumers. So as far as COP is concerned, you know, I, uh, frankly speaking, this, again, it's a top-down approach. Um, I, uh, how can I say, kudos to, the, to, to those who are trying to make something happen. And of course, yes, we are here in oil-rich country um, uh, that's sort of saying, it's okay, we should make it last as long as possible. And our answer is no, we want it to end as quickly as possible by putting the right incentives in place and moving everybody in the right direction. Oh, thank you for that, Hank. Uh, Patience, I want to ask you the same question. Um, what are you most hopeful here? What do you think we're going to accomplish at COP this year? Well, I, I really don't have hope. But um, when you look at what happened at the beginning of COP about the pledging of the loss and damage fund, the basket is open, but the money inside the basket is like a drop in an ocean. Global North leaders have forgotten their role, their roles in the fight for climate justice. And it's always like us to remind them their position when it comes to climate justice, when it comes to human rights. And it should not be brought in form of like financial aid. They're not helping anyone. They're paying back what the Global South owes them. The other thing about fossil fuels, we need a just transition, fair, fast, and forever. Thank you very much. John, it seems like a, a good question to ask of, of you as well. What do you think and we're gonna do at this COP? What are you most hopeful for? I'm, I'm a, uh, in my faith walk, we have a saying, being a prisoner of hope. And I have nothing but hope to hold on to that we can make a difference because I believe in human potential. I have, believe in the ability of people to make changes when they need to, when they're of a mind to work together, and when they're faced with an existential crisis such as this. COP, yes, sometimes it is discouraging because of the message you hear from member nations and others and you hear the gobbledygook of language and playing games and tricks with words. But we need to cut down to the basic essentials. If we need to get out, as the gentleman on the end said, then we need to set an actual timetable, a drop dead point, and do it. If we're going to phase down, then by that time, we phase down and then phase out. But we have to take those steps and those measures. No great movement has ever been done by just one or two individuals. It has taken the mass of people. And in this case, we need, using some of American history, we need a Manhattan-sized project where the whole nation gets behind it. We need a project that's so big, it's a quantum leap from where we are to where we want to be. And the only way we can do that is by having hope and vision, and as just was said earlier, going to work, each and every one of us doing our part.
Thank you so much for that, John. Um, thank you, Patience. Thank you so much, Hank. And I also want to say thank you on behalf of Facing Future TV to the International Society for Ecological Economics. Um, thank you, each and every one of you, for joining us today. Let's keep fighting this fossil fuel endgame and make sure we end the fossil fuel era. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.